folks. Uh, it's Dave Burroughs. I'm CEO and CIO here at Barometer Capital Management. I want to welcome everybody on our Tuesday 4 p.m. weekly webcast Barometer Readings. Uh, I got with me today a couple of our key portfolio managers to talk about a couple of our companies. And of course, you know, I guess we can't get around it. We got to think about uh, U.S. election. It's election day. Uh, in case you've been living under a rock, uh, I, I won't. I won't. I won't say uh, uh, I'm uh, cherishing the day. It's uh, it's something that uh, has been coming, and certainly lots of noise. I won't be sad to see it go. Um, I guess the caveat is we'd like to see a decision. Uh, the longer it's drawn out, uh, the less positive it is. Uh, but frankly, coming into the election today, market has been remarkably stable. Um, I always say the market dislikes uncertainty the most. And despite the fact that it appears to be one of the tightest races in history, we'll see tonight because there's always a surprise. Uh, of course, the betting lines have had uh, Trump out ahead. Uh, and I think that they vacillated back and forth. We, of course, spend a bunch of time trying to understand what the market's telling us. Uh, we've said many times that we think that the market is probably the best analyst. So it doesn't really matter what our opinions are. Uh, it's important that we understand what the market is telling us and make sure that our portfolios are aligned with what's going on out there. Uh, it's not our job to fight the tape. Uh, there are people who would like to do that. That's not us. Um, so the reason we do this weekly webcast every week is to take a look at what's going on, what we're seeing sector to sector, uh, what we're seeing in the macro, uh, and asking the question, should we be making changes to our portfolios or are we in a good spot? We aren't trying to be everywhere. We're trying to identify parts of the market that have a tailwind, that are well aligned with the current backdrop, geopolitically, financially, economically, uh, and, uh, and we always have to reassess you know, we do look at these things every day and our job is to recognize change. So we always start with the big picture, which we'll do again this week. Um, we've got a, a market that has been in a bull market in the U.S. Uh, since 2013 with interruptions along the way. Certainly when we look at how, what the market's done since then, there have been a series of corrections. Each one sort of coming down and touching on that rising blue 200 week moving average. Most recent one ended in January of this year, and we've been having an orderly March higher so far in the month, up about 0.6 of 1%. In fact, that's probably a little bit late because the market did charge a little bit at the end of the day. Um, but it has been the case that after you have a cyclical bear market, whether that is in time or in price, like we saw in 2020, when you eventually make a new high, you generally get two, three, four five years of relatively low volatility returns going forward. And we think we're in the relatively early stages of that. When we look a little bit under the microscope, this is to orient you October 22 low. We've seen a series of higher lows since then. Uh, S&P has been marking its way higher. We are trading not far off highs. And I think it's clear to say with us trading above all of the various moving averages, this market has been in an uptrend. And that's important. Now, of course, when you get a newsworthy event like a U.S. presidential election, you're going to have people get concerned. They may be feeling vulnerable politically. Uh, they may worry about things that the market hasn't considered. I'd argue that most investors have tried to look around the corner to see what might be coming next. And of course, we never really know. But I do also always find it a contrarian indicator when you head into an event and there is a big spike in the buying of puts, that is people trying to buy protection against a weak market. Generally, when you see a spike in puts, it's time for the market to go the other way. So this is the highest put call reading as of yesterday since October of 2023, second highest reading since late 2022 at the worst part of the bear market. You can see October 22, big spike here. Uh, and again, as I say, generally that happens at a moment of weakness. When we come into an event, we always care about the setup going in, especially if it's been in place for a while, because generally one event doesn't turn the tables. 
The market is a machine, a system made up of a thousand moving parts. And there's a lot of things that influence what's happening in the market. Rarely is one item the thing that will upset the apple cart, especially if the backdrop is relatively positive. When we look at what happened coming into an election, when the market was in an uptrend, the following three months on average up 84% of the time, an average 5.4%, the following six months up an average 7%, up 85% of the time. On the other hand, when the market came into an election in a downtrend, below the moving averages, lower lows and lower highs, on average, three months out, the market was down 2.6%, only positive 40% of the time. This is not the case. We're coming into the election on a reasonably good footing. When we look at previous election days, again, put call data, as we just talked about, spiked ahead of the last three election cycles. This is the election in 2020. We came in generally moving higher, little pullback into the, into the election. And then market rallied coming out. Uh, 2016, uh, market firmed up coming in on the election day. Of course, we had a huge rally uh, following the initial Trump election. Certainly surprised me. Uh, and markets went on to work their way higher. And if you go back to 2012, we came in in a very clear downtrend. Uh, election day did have a lot of put buying and it continued lower for several more days, but in fact, then rallied the rest of the year. So we do care about the setup coming in. Setup so far uh, came in pretty bullish. Uh, if we look at different parts of the market, they're not all the same. We talked for quite some time about the fact that the QQQ, the NASDAQ 100 made it high in July of this year did have a sharp sell-off, much sharper than the S&P, uh, has been unable to attain new highs, uh, and recently, over the last week, broke down out of this, what I would call a pennant price formation. That's a market that is narrowed in price range and then broke to the downside. It doesn't make me feel warm and fuzzy about the NASDAQ. In general, the NASDAQ, um, some of the components have underperformed, and from a relative perspective, has not been leadership in the market for several months. Mid cap stocks, on the other hand, came into the event today quite strong. Some would say that more aligned with uh, Trump because he's talking about deregulation. Uh, certainly today uh, up about 2%. Uh, now that's probably, you know, people following the playbook um, uh, from previous elections. Seasonally. Well, seasonally, actually, we're headed into a period where the rubber hits the road for the NASDAQ. It tends to be it does outperform for the rest of the year. We'll see. So far, that has not shown up. But the seasonal strength in the Russell 2000 has shown up uh, and does appear as though, you know, early part of November here, we start to see some strength. Now, looking out around the world, you can see a few things. We look at breadth as being important in a market. In an asset class, breadth is important too. It's great that the US market is doing fine, but it's also great that we're seeing improving market breadth in Asia Pacific markets, European markets, Canada, Latin America, Brazil, Australia, London. Even China has remarkably been strong recently, despite you know, the depths of their economic woes. So we're seeing lots of markets participate. Looking at the TSX, we have been marking our way higher steadily over the last 12 months. And in fact, TSX is leading the U.S. stock market so far in the year, partly because of the sectors that make up the TSX. Moving on to fixed income, we've talked a lot about this generational low in interest rates in 2020, where we reversed 40 years of declining rates. The long-term rates steadily moved lower until 2020, and we've seen since then a series of higher highs and higher lows in yields, which is meaningful for certain sectors. There's sectors that do well in disinflation and there's sectors that do well in inflation and they're not the same thing. Bond investors who enjoyed a tremendous bull market over 40 years have really suffered over the last four years. This is the long end of the US bond market, the TLT, unable to get up off the carpet trading below all of the long-term moving averages 
and still roughly 50% off the highs. It's in fact the longest bear market going back over the last 40 years. So for income investors who like to think that fixed income is the conservative asset to hold, this has been a very disappointing four years. We've been very uh, cautious with bonds since 2020. We focused much more on dividend growth stocks in our income strategy. Um, I've had some people say, does it mean that there's risk because they've been doing so well? And we are big believers that when structural change takes place, it can go on a long time. So dividend growth stocks relative to the aggregate bond index has been outperforming since 2020. It had a period of sideways during the rate uh, hike cycle in the central banks. But had since, since the market started looking beyond it, uh, certainly uh, dividend growth has just continued to work its way higher and it's at relative highs versus the bond market. Now, I think it's really important in every strategy to have a lot of flexibility. In our income strategy, we can be in any kind of cash flow generating asset. And ideally, like in our equity strategy, we want to find things that are good getting better. And for us, in this kind of environment, good getting better is a company that's generating a lot of cash and has an ability to pay its dividend, but has an ability to grow its dividend over time. If you've got a rising cost of living and inflation is your concern, the number one thing you want to protect against is inflation eating your money. If we look as income investors at what happened any time in red, the 10-year treasury yield was rising. We know in every one of those cases, while the 10-year treasury yield was rising, these are all the date ranges, bond prices were falling. That's not great for an income investor. And because we've been able to get to things that can have an inflation hedge in rising rates, and most importantly, March since uh, September of 2020, uh, the 10-year bond index down 15.6% over that period, uh, the income strategy up 44.4%. So this is an income strategy aimed at doing well through all kinds of income and, uh, 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 interest rate environments. Since the middle of, uh, since the beginning of the year, aggregate bond index is up 1.9%. Uh, the Canadian broad bond index of 2.8%, the corporate bond index of 1.9%, uh, barometer income fund up 19.35%. And in fact, if we go back over the 23 years we've been running this strategy, um, strategies uh, annualized just over 10% a year uh, versus a mixed benchmark of the TSX equity income uh, index and the bond index. So uh, this is something that we're quite proud of. Uh, when we move on to commodities, commodities, again, are, are starting to lift. Again, it's an inflation hedge. Clearly, with bond yields going higher, while the Fed is cutting rates, bond investors are saying, we think that inflation is going to be a continued problem. And hard assets, especially scarce commodities, are a hedge against that. And so we're seeing strength there. Certainly, we've had a great rally in gold, and we think that that's relatively early days. And importantly, we've seen copper start to wake up uh, after, after the Fed's tightening. Uh, and this week, uh, seeing a small reversal, we'll see whether that follows through over the following few weeks and months. I guess the other thing that maybe points a little bit towards more inflation is the fact that Bitcoin has started to lift in price, and we certainly want to watch that as well. Could, the election could have an impact here where the Republicans are a little bit more supportive. So look, we don't have to be anywhere. Uh, our job is to target market leadership. We're trying to identify parts of the market where due to structural change, things are being revalued versus the way they've been looked at previously. So we're trying to find things that are good getting better, where there is money getting put to work, and we, we can see a clear theme that is playing out. We're always watching for change, which is why I do this webcast, because I got to go through all of the 300 various universe of securities we look at to look for things that are getting better or things that are getting worse. And in the absence of strength, our job is to play some defense. So the portfolios are meant to be tactical. We don't love to change the portfolios, but when it's required, it's our job to recognize it before it becomes obvious. 
Now, as I've talked before, there's three things that impact price in a portfolio. Getting to the right neighborhoods is, is like 80% of the return. Finding the right asset classes like equities or commodities. And then finding the industries or sectors that are benefiting from the change. About 20% of return is specific to the security. So our top-down work takes all of the various universes we can focus in. We try to identify those that have a tailwind, that are seeing new net money get put to work. And at any given time, there's a few. Sometimes more, sometimes less. Now, the way that we look at that is in the course of any cycle, uh, when you get late in the down cycle, you'll see a few things quietly turn higher. They are generally the leaders, the things that are most fundamentally sound. And as things get better, more and more securities participate. And in an up cycle, a mark of health is if more and more securities are participating, it means money's getting put to work, that's healthy. We're looking for sectors or themes that are seeing expansion in breadth. Now, the second piece of the strategy is we're trying to find securities to express our view. We take a universe of several thousand securities, looking for a combination of about 20 factors that point to securities or companies going through a positive change, where the fundamentals in the income statement and the balance sheet are improving, and where we can find price is also performing the way that we would expect it to, given that we think things are positive. And at any given time, there's maybe several things that we could be buyers of, where we find securities that meet our business test and they line up with parts of the market that are seeing net inflows of capital. Well, that's where our portfolio lives, and that's a living, breathing thing. The last piece of the strategy, and I always want to emphasize this, is the easiest thing to do is to buy securities. The hardest thing to do is know when to exit. Thematically, when we start to see deteriorating breadth, where the leading securities are doing well, but some of the weaklings have started to roll over, it tells us there's weakness under the surface. It means that we stop putting any new money to work. Right? We raise a little bit of cash. We tighten up the stop losses that we use on all of our positions. And to the extent that we see deterioration of breadth, we put no new money to work. So I go through that each week just as a reminder. When, so when we look at this data, we understand what we're looking at. I can tell you that in Canada, in the U.S., and globally, the percent of stocks in uptrends has been expanding and is stable. This is coming into a period of a lot of uncertainty. We've gone through September, October, which are arguably the two weakest months of the year. We've been through the six weakest months of the year in the calendar from April, end of April to the end of October. We're headed into the strongest part of the year, but we're headed into an election. Yet the market has been remarkably resilient. I would say there are shock absorbers built in. Now, I said uh, three weeks ago, it's likely we'll have a little bit of bouncing around over the next couple of weeks. And we did that see in our short-term indicators, but the important ones are the long-term indicators. Three weeks ago, we talked about the fact that if you just looked at a simple measure, the percent of stocks trading about their long-term or 200 day moving average. As the market was running out of gas into the end of 2021, the percent of stocks trading above their long-term moving average had been deteriorating, the same thing we were just talking about. When we looked at it, look at it today, for the last number of months, it's been very steady in a range between kind of 60 and 80%. So there's no sign of deterioration and the market has been in a nice uptrend. Now, when we look at the NASDAQ, it's not quite the same. There has been a little weakness under the surface, which would explain why we have an underweight in technology, but that's one part of the market. So now here we are uh, in the meat of the reporting season. We've been through these two big weeks. We're into the uh, week where things really start to taper off. In general, earnings have been pretty good. We're headed into the, the highlight of the Canadian reporting season. So we'll get a lot more information over the next couple of weeks. But as companies report, they come out of the blackout period, and if they have share buybacks, they're able to resume those. So large part of those have resumed, and we have a lot of share buybacks that have been announced for this year. So the last two months of the year, we tend to see a lot of activity in share buybacks. That will add additional support to the market. So here we are heading into the election. Um, we'll see how long it takes. If you went by conventional wisdom, you know, the backdrop's been pretty good. 
U.S. GDP as of last week in the third quarter was up 2.8%, consumer spending up 2.5%. Uh, the ADP employment data last week added 233,000 jobs versus what was expected at 113,000, so jobs relatively strong. Personal consumption came in ahead of what was expected. Pending home sales were well above what was expected. Gas is pretty cheap, and the s and is up 23 24% on the year. By historical met metrics, the incumbent generally wins. You got good jobs, good economy, good stock market, cheap gas. Okay, but that is a very simple way of looking at it. If we break the two parties down based on what their platforms have been, Republicans deregulation, lower corporate taxes, you know, um, uh, uh, potential for uh, foreign tariffs, uh, deregulation would help financials, industrials, materials, and small and mid-sized companies. Um, less regulation on Bitcoin. You know, these things we should see showing up in the market if they are likely to win. On the other side, Democrats, big supporters of alternative energy, uh, electric vehicles, infrastructure spending, uh, home builders, student loan forgiveness should be good for the consumer. So let's take a look and see what's happening. Let's start with financials. Financials have been marking their way up through the course of the year. They've been very steady performers, basically the strongest group in the market year to date. Um, we showed last week that financials relative to the S&P were making new highs. We've seen new, no weakness whatsoever. About 94% of the companies in the financial sector are in uptrends. And frankly, if we look in Europe, it's the same thing. Now, earlier in the year, I said 40 years of falling rates favored the borrower. And the truth is, if we are into steadily rising rates, forget the administered rate, the, what the bond market says are the rates, the power belongs in the hands of the lender. And this would be borne out right now. The banking sector seems to be doing well. This is the capital markets banks. We showed this last week. This is relative price behavior versus the market. This blue line is rising, means it's outperforming. And you can see we're basically at relative new highs. So that's pretty favorable. That's the market saying we expect lots of trading. We expect lots of uh, new issuance and uh, mergers and acquisitions. Uh, that probably lines up a little bit more with the Republican side. And certainly the insurance sector has been great through the course here. We've talked about lots of the companies. We talked about progressive and reinsurance, which we've ent uh, exited. We've talked about intact financial. Uh, and I've asked, um, asked uh, Brian McNichol to join us today to talk a little bit about Fairfax. I've mentioned several times through the year, this is our largest position as a firm. That's been a very steady performer. It's a company not a lot of people know really, really well. So I thought maybe, Brian, you could come on. We obviously you know, had a great day here two days ago uh, when they reported earnings. It's they've had a number of good days this year. Um, what are your thoughts here? Yeah, perfect. So I guess just briefly for a little bit of uh, background on Fairfax. So they primarily operate in the insurance and reinsurance sector. Uh, they have operations ranging from property and casualty insurance to specialty lines, uh, but they also have a significant investment portfolio that includes equities, fixed income, as well as alternatives, uh, of which they've been able to deliver some pretty consistent returns. And in fact, they uh, you know recently bumped up their guidance to which they are now targeting $2 billion in interest and dividend income for the next four years. Um, so that's been a really great part of their business for them. Uh, now, you know, as Dave mentioned, we as a firm have talked quite a bit about the insurance space this year, and we remain heavily involved in both Canada and the U.S., uh, this past year alone, the PNC insurance space, uh, they've greatly benefited from moderating inflationary pressure, uh, higher investment income, but also price increases uh, brought on by hard market conditions. So as such, we've seen companies like Fairfax really tend to outperform. Uh, shares for Fairfax are up over 50% year to date. Uh, that's versus 18% for the TSX and then 24% for the rest of the financial space within Canada. So it's been a really solid performer for us. Um, they've demonstrated a, ro a robust track record of uh, profitability and growth over the years. Uh, they've dis they've um, they have a very disciplined underwriting, uh, as well as their strategic acquisitions have consistently yielded great returns. And over the past five years, they've been able to see total insurance premiums uh, written expand eighty five percent. So this is far outpacing the average of the other top twenty 
uh, largest PNC insurers globally. And Fairfax still trades at a very sizable discount, roughly 11% to the uh, the peer average. Uh, now, looking forward into 2025, we continue to see some pretty good upside here. Uh, we expect the number of record the record number of catastrophic events that occurred this past year, uh, mainly all the hurricanes most recently, uh, will help maintain the current market conditions that these insurance companies are seeing. Uh, coupled with uh, you know continued moderating uh, inflation. Uh, this should help drive enhanced profitability, uh, further facilitating returns on uh, equity expansion, of which Fairfax has been outperforming global peers for the last few years. So all in, um, you know, it's it's a very, very positive environment for these guys. And it's why it's been our our top performer, as well as our largest position uh, firm-wide. It's, it's interesting, isn't it, Brian? It's hard to look at catastrophic events and think that they're a good thing. But if you're an insurance company, it seems to be perfect cover for raising premiums. Definitely. And, and they can, they can uh, create I, a lot of those say, around. It, it makes me feel a lot better when I get my auto insurance and home insurance telling me how much is going up to think, well, at least we're benefiting, you know, their shareholdings of Fairfax. But it's uh, it's a business that seems to be pretty well insulated because the market accepts price increases. Of course. And it creates a lot of noise around the quarters. And we as investors just have to understand that these are sometimes transitory uh, impacts. But the impact that it has on the pricing environment uh, is a positive gain for future quarters ahead. So it's actually, you know, net, net, a positive. Great. Thank Brent. Thanks very much for jumping on. Thanks very much for jumping on. So just, to, just to, to recap here, you know, last in the election in 2016, when the election day came, we had a big, big pickup in the banks and the regional banks and a big pickup in uh, small and mid-sized companies. That's a Russell 2000 relative to the S&P. My guess is the markets are, are sort of leaning in this direction. Uh, moving beyond industrials, you know, relative strength for the equally weighted basket of industrial companies in the U.S. Uh, made up of a broad cross-section of companies, you know, continues to perform well. It was up 1.25% today. Crane is a company that we've spoken about on our previous calls, uh, went out today very close to a relative new high and an absolute new high. And that's been a very strong performer, spun out basically in the uh, valves and flow control technologies, uh, you know, used across all kinds of different industrial processes. Um, but we also own a company called MDA Limited, uh, it's it's an industrial, you can look at it as a technology company. I've asked Emmett Joshi to jump on today. Uh, it's really had a head of steam over the last little while, and they've had lots of interesting uh, announcements. It's trading better than 95% of companies in the S&P over the course of the year. You can see recently it's had a, a nice run up. Emmett, talk to us a little bit about MDA because a lot of, a lot of people will not know this Canadian company. Yeah, definitely. Thanks, Dave. Uh, and you're right, it's, uh, it is a company that's been under the radar uh, for the most part at a $3 billion market cap, but a really interesting company nonetheless. Uh, MDA Space Limited is a Canadian space technology company. They're focused on satellite systems, Earth observation, space robotics, and mission-critical space operations. Uh, very interesting. Their three business lines serve nearly every sector of the global space economy. And uh, MDA is a major player within the industry with products that serve commercial, government, and defense clients. Uh, we're really excited about the growth potential of the space economy itself and feel this could be a significant theme for several years. Uh, and we're currently in the very early, early innings. There's a recent study by the World Economic Forum and McKinsey and Co. that pegs the global space opportunity growing to about 1.8 trillion by 2035. Uh, that's from approximately 630 million in 2023, so about a 9% per annum growth rate. Um, and like I said, really in the early innings. Uh, and MDA is well suited to participate in this growth through their three business lines, robotics and space operations, satellite systems, and uh, geo-intelligence. The largest... Damn it, there's, uh, been, there's been some satellite news over the last, last few weeks that may be helping to drive things. We all hear about, about Starlink and Elon right. Musk's exercise in, in low orbiting um, satellites. Talk a little bit about MDA's satellite business. Yeah, definitely. So MDA's, uh, MDA's satellite business is actually their largest revenue generator at 44% of revenues. Um, and they uh, their expertise is in low uh, earth orbit satellites. 
uh, and they're used by their partners for satellite constellations. They enable broadband internet in rural geographies, uh, as well as mobile communications, internet of things, connected vehicles, defense applications, you name it. So really, really, really interesting. We've had a few announcements from uh, MDA's partners. Early in September, one of MDA's partners, Telesat, finalized a 2.5 billion uh, financing with the government of Canada. This is for their light speed LEO constellation program. Um, and MDA is a main partner and satellite manufacturer for Telesat. So we expect that uh, MDA should start recognizing some revenue from this project over the next few quarters. Uh, they will report earnings on November 15th, and we should see some guidance uh, revised to the upside on the back of this contract as well. And then as recently as last Friday, another one of MDA's partners, Global Star, received a substantial investment from Apple and a disclosed agreement for a mobile satellite service network. So uh, Apple is going to take a 20% equity stake in Global Star. Uh, although there's no additional work contracted for MD at this point, we do believe that MDA would continue to be a prime contractor for Global Star. So a really, really interesting opportunity. Uh, there's a ton of backlog visibility here for MDA, which we're really excited about. Just under $5 billion in, vis in revenue visibility in their backlog, which is about three to four years of, of work. And that backlog has been growing at a 77% compound rate since 2020. Uh, so a very strong pipeline of work under all three verticals, but specifically under satellite systems, which keeps us really excited in terms of story. Great. We never like to get too married to one idea. I mean, of course, we're always ready to make a change to our opinion if, if the market stops agreeing with us or we get information that doesn't fit with the story as we know it. Uh, so there's always some risk when we talk about these companies, but really it's it's more to help people understand the types of things that we care about. And when I think about MDA, this is a great strong business in, uh, in uh, the space industry, but they really are seeing an acceleration in the underlying business, which means that investors, as they become more bullish on investments in and around the space industry, uh, are willing over time to pay a higher multiple of earnings as they gain confidence that this is becoming more financially viable uh, and with a longer, deeper pipeline. So it's one of the reasons I wanted to highlight this company today. So thanks very much, Amit, for, for jumping no on. I, I, I really appreciate it. Um, mo moving beyond uh, financials and industrials, uh, you know, materials have had a little pullback over the last uh, last uh, two months, uh, firming up a little bit here. Certainly, you know, the gold sector has been very, very strong and one that we've been most focused on over the course of year. This makes up the majority of our materials exposure, Agnico Eagle, um, uh, Kinross Gold, uh, Alamos Gold in the in the mid size companies, um, we have a little bit of Franco, and uh, and then certainly the copper companies like Tech B, uh, you know, look quite interesting. So the cyclicals in general, relative to the defensive sectors, have really been lifting over the last two months, and we just want to highlight that coming into the election. And coming into now the seasonally stronger period, these are the companies that would benefit in the next business cycle if, in fact, there isn't a slowdown in front of us. And I would say this, you know, this chart is telling us the market does not believe currently we've got a slowdown in front of us. Communications has been strong over the last few weeks, and we really just have a couple of positions there, Netflix and Meta. Uh, you know, Meta is the, by far the largest uh, company in this group. Uh, and then on the other side, uh, sectors that you would expect to do a little better were the Democrats to win. Consumer discretionary has had, you know, decent uh, absolute performance, but weak relative performance versus the market. Consumer staples have been, you know, fairly, fairly ugly. Certainly, I was noticing Estee Lauder is down, I don't know, 75 percent, probably because of its exposure to China. Um, the uh, automated uh, and electric vehicle uh, ETF really has not been performing. Tesla's performing much better, but the rest of the sector is not. Uh, and clean energy and alternative energy really has been making relative lows through the course of the year. So um, without knowing anything other than what the market tells me, it appears to me more likely that we're going to see um, a, a Republican outcome. Healthcare probably would spin the same story. 
So not for me to judge. Um, our job is just to make sure that we're lined up with what's going on in the market. From a technology perspective, I mentioned earlier, the percent of stocks above their 200 day moving average has been weakening. Um, so we have been more cautious here. Semiconductors in particular have had weak relative strength. We do notably have two companies. We have uh, Broadcom and we have NVIDIA. If you take those two companies out of the semiconductor index, in fact, the relative performance has been downright awful. Um, so um, if we look at NVIDIA and Broadcom, NVIDIA is trading better than 97% of companies in the S&P and is very close to making new highs. Uh, Broadcom, AVGO is a little bit off the high, but trading better than 91% of companies has had pretty steady relative price improvement. So it makes me nervous to have a weak sector and a couple of strong stocks, but these two companies arguably have the best foothold in AI. Uh, we'll see what the earnings look like when they come, but it sounds as though demand continues to be very robust. So to break it down, um, as of the week of the 4th of November, the average sector has 45% of stocks in uptrends. If we place all of the sectors on a distribution curve and put the sectors with the highest percent of stocks that are performing well on the right side and the ones that are weakest from a breadth perspective on the left, you can see in general weakness in healthcare, that's biotech, healthcare, pharma's down here. Um, if you were to look at the consumer, auto and leisure and housing and staples, not so great. If you look at the right side of the ledger, the sectors that have the broadest participation, banks, insurance, Wall Street, regional banks, financials really lead. Uh, we also have had some strength in precious metals, uh, aerospace in the in the um, defense, uh, sorry, in the uh, industrial sector and machinery. So it is a split market. I would say that typically by late in a bull market, these sectors will be stacked down at the far right hand side where everything is doing well. That's not the case currently. So I think that there's lots of room to run. Looking at it through a political lens, the basket of companies that would fit with the Republican themes have been outperforming recently. Uh, now, it's been going on this way for months and months. It's not like this is just a recent thing. These sectors have been kind of leading and the cyclicals are outperforming defensives, which gives us you know, more confidence in the business cycle. So what does it mean? Financials continue to be by far our largest weight about twice the weight of the S&P. Technology is about half of, our, of the weight in the S&P. The weight in the S&P is coming down because some companies are shrinking. Industrials were about one and a half times the market weight. Uh, we have a, a significant uh, exposure in energy, but it's largely Canadian pipelines and long-lived assets. Materials are over three times the market weight, and that's just really due to the strength in the precious metals. Um, consumer, that's staples and discretionary, is relatively small. Uh, healthcare is very small. We've taken that down fairly considerably over the last couple of months. Uh, and we have a very small cash weight. So, so far, I think we're pretty well aligned with what's going on. We do want to keep in mind that we are in a liquidity cycle now. Central banks around the world are cutting rates. The single biggest positive for asset prices is liquidity. When we look at uh, credit risk, the excess return demanded by bond investors by corporate or high yield bonds has been coming down. That means they're not concerned with credit risk. The uh, index of economic surprise, whether economic data is coming in ahead or behind expectation has been rising. That means generally the economic data is getting better and volatility remains in a very comfortable band, which is typical during a cyclical bull market. So look, anything can happen. We don't know what the outcome is going to be of the election. But I will say it would be very unlikely to see a significantly adverse reaction in the market, given all of these pieces that fit with a fairly uh, constructive market. So we'll know, you know, we'll get a sense for it over the next few days. Hopefully it is not a long drag, 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 dragged out process. Um, but only, only we will know in the next few days. Seasonally, well, seasonally, we are into a very constructive time in the market. 
if we look at election years or non-election years, in general, positive, a little bit more positive in non-election years. When the bull market gets to be two years old, like it is, October 22 was the low. If you get through the first two years, on average, the bull market lasted five and a half years. If you look at it just on the line chart, you can see this current bull market is relatively short. And it's nothing to say it has to continue on, but the signs are so far that it will. We're into the six best months of the year. In the years where the six bad years, six bad months were positive, the six best months tended to be very good, up 13, 14%. And when we look at the market being up over 17% on the first 10 months of the year through the end of October, December tends to be positive up on average 2.7% and November up 3.3 or total average 6% for November and December. I highlighted this last week. We all wanna know who's gonna win the election, but the history is the Democrats have had some wonderful stock markets the Republicans have had some wonderful stock markets. They both had some stinkers. There is no correlation one to the other. Now, at the end of the day, at some point, there will be some weakness, and it will be our job to play defense. Whether it was during the tech wreck of the two early 2000s, the financial crisis, you know, the, the China slowdown in 2015, uh, the COVID sell-off in 2020, or the bear market, of 21, 22, in general, we were able to play pretty good defense along the way when that takes place. But as it sits right now, we think that conditions are quite favorable and we're fairly fully invested. So with that, why don't we take a look and see if there's any questions. And uh, we got a lot of folks on the line today. So uh, one question we're getting here from uh, Richard LaBelle is um, on Bombardier. And his question is, we've spoken about owning Embryar uh, as a growth investor. Uh, he owns Bombardier, which has been doing quite well over the last the several quarters. And in fact, you know, we talked about it this morning. Let me see if I can throw it up on the screen. Amit, I think you're still on. If you are, do you want to give us some of your thoughts on Bombardier? Or yeah. Brian? If, uh, yeah, we're, we're, we're both still on and we, we know this story well. Yeah. Um, I would say, you know, we, we don't own it currently, but we do like the setup here. Uh, you know, I think the fact is that we're, our, our portfolios are pretty much full right now. Uh, so it's on our it's on our sidelines, on our roster. Um, but there is a lot of near term demand in the business jet market. Uh, recent deliveries for Bombardier show that they're well ahead of their uh, quarterly consensus for business jet deliveries. So uh, I think the setup is is pretty meaningful and we're going to see a pretty good inflection point in free cash flow for 2025. Um, I believe current numbers are looking for somewhere between 900 to 1 billion uh, free cash over 2025. And given Bombardier's history, uh, that's that's fairly meaningful. So uh, I, I still really like the setup here on a longer term uh, thesis. Yeah, Great. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks, Brian. And, and certainly, you know, we have we have been speaking about it. It has been a strong performer. And we got a question here on Ferrari. Ferrari reported their earnings today. Um, it had a little bit of a weak, um, a weak response. It was down 7%. Um, it's trading better than 82% of companies in the S&P. We find that um, uh, as we've gone through this earnings period, there have been lots of companies that have had some weak one-day responses out of the, out of the bat, off the bat. I was speaking to James Callahan about Ferrari earlier this morning. Um, they are in the middle of an implementation of a new ERP system. Uh, and as those that know, ERP systems can be a little bit tricky. That's large enterprise-wide uh, resource management uh, systems. Uh, and so they came in slightly late on their deliveries. Um, this is a company that is very, very good at managing how much they supply to the market, uh, which is probably why it was weaker today. We don't think that this changes anything. It's trading you know, nicely above this long-term uh, 200 day moving average. We'll see how it trades over the next few days. My guess is it probably shrugs this off. 
Um, uh, we have a question here. Have we started to think about increasing our REIT weighting? Um, we do have a position in Simon Properties Group. Um, we think that this has been one of the best performers. Uh, in fact, it made a relative strength new high today. Uh, Simon Properties is probably the highest quality uh, retail REIT. Uh, they have 69 uh, premium, um, uh, premium outlets, uh, a ton of different properties. Um, it's, uh, you know, it's a nice yield. It doesn't have a ton of, of uh, dividend growth. And that would be the only knock that I would say. The REITs in general, you know, can have a headwind in rising rates. Um, but, um, you know, we do have the Simon Properties. It's something, it's a group that we'll, we'll sort of continue to look at. Um, gold ETF. David, looking at buying a gold ETF seems GLD is outperforming XGD. Let's talk about that a little bit. Pete, GLD is a, an ETF, a, a note aimed at out, sorry, performing like gold itself. So um, this is in effect a gold note. If you look at XGD, XGD is a basket of gold producers, sorry. And I don't think I'm going to be able to pull it up on this system. Yeah, it's old data. Here we go. XGD. So this is this trades in Canada, um, and uh, and it's a, a a gold ETF. If you look at GDX, which is the broadly based gold producers ETF in the U.S., it's the same. And I'll tell you the reason that it is lagging is Newmont. Newmont is about the biggest company in the group. Uh, it's a large cap producer. They have had a history of operational problems. Uh, and once again, this quarter, they, they really disappointed. Um, that is the problem with gold producers. Um, you know, you need to stick with the best ones that you were looking at uh, Newmont there. <laughs> There's Agnico. That's a different picture. Um, so uh, actually, the, the junior gold ETF, GDXJ, has outperformed the GDX. Uh, but I think that really this is something you want to be a little bit more rifle shot on. Agnico has been performing really well. Uh, Alamos Gold, you know, has been very, very strong. Kinross uh, has been very strong. And um, so you, you pick your spots. There's a number of them. But uh, if, if I were picking a physical gold ETF, I would prefer PHYS, which is the Sprott Physical Gold Trust. It actually owns bullion. And it's held in the warehouse. You're not saying some nobody saying, trust me, we'll pay you based on the amount that it goes up. Um, and with that, we might have most of the questions asked. Fairfax, would we continue to buy Fairfax at this price? Look, this has been a, a great performer all year long. You can see that it has at times become stretched away from the 50-day moving average. It has a had a tendency to pull back in. So we just had a big spike higher. We moved a little higher. I, I you know, I think it's a great company uh, and we're very happy to own it. I'm not sure we chase it when it gets stretched away from the moving averages, uh, but we do think that the future is quite good. So we're very happy to be holders at this level. Uh, and, uh, you know, any time it kind of pulls back toward the 50 day is probably a good time to be a buyer. I think that's it. Guys, Brian and Amit, thanks very much for joining today. Um, and thanks everybody for tuning in. If you got questions that we haven't answered, send us an email, uh, or give us a call. We're happy to jump on the line. Um, you know, we've got 200 wonderful families we take care of, and, uh, it's a business that we love to be in. If, uh, if you think we could be a help, don't hesitate to reach out. Um, you know, any businesses in the business are growing. So thanks very much for tuning in. We'll see you again next week.